challenge in Nigeria is to Britons and Africans alike. Both want Nigeria to grow into an independent nation within the British Commonwealth. What are the obstacles? Disunity, poverty, die-hard tradition, ignorance. How fast can they be overcome? How soon can Nigeria become a free nation? The British went to Nigeria in 1861 to put down traffic in slaves. Today, Nigeria is Britain's biggest protectorate, larger than France and Italy combined. It has a greater population than those of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand put together. Its people speak many different languages, with hundreds of dialects, belong to different races, practice different religions. In the Muslim north, on the fringe of the Sahara, live the Hausa people, rooted in tradition, often suspicious of Western ideas. They form half the population of Nigeria. Only 50 years ago, their ancestors were ruthless slave traders, raiding and devastating the villages of their weaker neighbors in the south. Britain accepted their principle of hereditary rule. And today, in the House of Chiefs, the Emirs, their rulers, meet with British officials to administer the northern provinces. In Kano, the northern capital, there are houses with electric light, telephones, and piped water. But modern ways have hardly touched the mass of people outside the city. The cattle herders of the open plains live as their forefathers did. And the trappings of civilization are distant indeed from the pagan people of the Joss Plateau. Southeast, the Igbo, farmers and smallholders, eager to learn, sometimes ready to contribute their labor free for community projects like this new road, linking together two villages. From among them, the government recruits a great many of its junior administrators. And they have a strong sense of fun. Southwest, the Yoruba. Fishermen, boatmen, farmers. They have a long and cruel history of civil war, in which whole districts were devastated and their inhabitants massacred and enslaved. Now their chiefs rule peacefully with British advice. Their capital, Ibadan, is the largest Negro city in Africa. 
but deep in the interior, old habits and old beliefs are still strong. Distances and lack of communication sharpen the isolation of tribe from tribe and are at the bottom of Nigeria's disunity. The railways, overworked and short of rolling stock, are unable to carry all the food and produce that might be going to the port. Too much of the land is worn out. Primitive agriculture and a population growing too fast have drained the soil of life. Many a village is facing the terrible reality of soil erosion leading to lowered standards of living, malnutrition, and disease. Contagious diseases like yours. Hookworm, often caught from infected water. Malaria, carried by mosquitoes. And epidemics of smallpox, yellow fever, typhus. Blindness, perhaps ten times as common in Africa as in England. Sleeping sickness, spread by the testy fly. Leprosy, 68,000 cases treated in a year. There is disease and poverty throughout Nigeria, the unrelieved poverty of millions who eke out of their living. Lagos, the capital, is badly overcrowded. Three out of five of the dwellings in the city have been condemned as not fit to live in. People are drawn to Lagos by the hope of a better job with more money, but there are not enough jobs. The startling truth is that the population of Nigeria has doubled in 50 years of peace. There can be no solution to Nigeria's problems unless her development, both economic and social, can be made to keep pace with this rapid growth of her people. Harsh enough challenges. Are they being met in part only? New bridges are going up. Great efforts are being made to patch up rolling stock and to keep it in repair. In England, the building of new locomotives for Nigeria is speeded up, and some are already on their way out. Mechanization has made a good beginning in the government-owned collieries in the east, and will increase output when the railways are ready to take the coal. The struggle to restore the fertility of eroded land has begun. At Minna, a dam is being built to irrigate parched soil and to supply villages with fresh water. A generation of better farmers is being built up, slowly because there are always too few instructors. But many young soldiers have come back from service in Burma and elsewhere, anxious to learn and ready to pass on their new knowledge to the people in their villages. Africans are being taught to fight disease that once they met with a hopeless fatalism. The sleeping sickness service is cutting down great areas of bush, destroying the breeding ground of the testy fly. Malaria is being kept down by the clearing out of mosquito swamps. Hookworm diminishes when clean water is available. Leprosy is being treated now with new drugs which hold out the promise of more cure. And the spread of knowledge is giving sufferers more confidence to come forward. The devoted work of private and missionary societies has been strengthened and extended since 1945 by a new government leprosy service. But the crying need is for more doctors, more nurses, 
more trained medical staff, more clinics and more hospitals. For all these services, Nigeria needs more money. And it is only from Nigeria's own resources that the money in the end can come. The country has great resources. Exports in 1947 amounted to 37 million pounds sterling. Timber produced three quarters of a million pounds in exports. Cotton, 300,000 pounds. Palm kernels and palm oil, nine and a half million pounds. Ground nuts for fat, six and a quarter million pounds. And this would have been far more if the railways had been able to move the stock. Cocoa, ten and a half million pounds. Tin, four million pounds worth of ore exported. And along with the privately owned industries, there is growing up a government-inspired cooperative movement. It sets out to improve the lot of the local craftsmen and smallholders. The biggest of the cooperatives protects the cocoa farm, helps him to sell his crops in the best market and to grow better cocoa. From the taxes and duties paid by industries, the Nigerian government derives a good part of its revenue. But beyond that, the British taxpayer, through the Colonial Development Fund, is contributing £23 million to be spent in Nigeria during the next ten years. But the strongest challenge has still to be met. Ignorance and traditional mistrust or even fear of Western ideas. In the Muslim North, only one child in 58 gets a school education. In the South, it is one child in seven. There is no free education in Nigeria. It usually costs from sevenpence to one and ninepence a week to send a child to school, though fees are often reduced to what parents can afford. The government has launched a scheme to provide free schools for all children, but it will take 30 years to do it. And in the bush, witch doctors and secret societies, juju, a strongly rooted belief in mysteries and spells. Good spells to protect a man and his crop, evil spells to blight his enemy. Against all that is dark and obsolete, teachers and missionaries have patiently fought. and there have been great victories for knowledge. Many Africans have risen to distinction and today occupy important posts. Police officers, barristers, high court judges. At this moment, about 600 are abroad. 
learning to be engineers, doctors, nurses, administrators, to reinforce those already hard at work. But in both North and South, and especially in the South, there are critics who are dissatisfied with Nigeria's rate of progress. In the North, a handful of them, stimulated by books and newspapers, urge a wider acceptance of Western ideas. In the South, there are nationalist movements. The most vigorous, led by Dr. Nam Diazikwe, best known as Zik, demands a half share for Africans in the government here and now, with full independence in 15 years' time. His newspapers, with the freedom that democracy gives them, bitterly criticize and seek to discredit British plans and practices. Zik has localized support in the South, but in the North, where half the people live, his following is negligible. Nevertheless, the questions he raises are important. Is Britain doing all she can, as fast as she can, to bring Nigeria to nationhood? Britain has set out to build Nigeria into a democratic structure. The pattern is complex. The village chief is encouraged to consult his people and to accept majority decisions. British officials, often administering large areas of the country, give counsel and guidance hearing disputes, teaching the principles of British justice. The emirs and chiefs, whose authority was recognized before Britain came to Nigeria, helped to run the country under the system of indirect rule, with the advice of a civil service under the governor in Lagos. In 1946, Nigeria took a great step forward. A new constitution was adopted, setting up in North, East and West elected Houses of Assembly to take decisions on regional affairs. At the same time, the Legislative Council was reformed and became a parliament for all Nigeria. In both assemblies and councils, Africans are in a majority, and though they are subject to the overriding power of the governor, all are able to learn and to practice the arts of government. How soon can Nigerians alone govern their country? The sharp conflict is not over the ultimate aim, but over the time it will take to achieve this aim. It will not be enough to hand over the government to an educated minority, or to return the people to the lordship of traditional rulers. <laughs> must be enabled to exercise their and as citizens. All must realize that they are part of a nation. But there are brave beginnings of a new sense of community in the experiments in cooperative efforts and most hopeful of all in the movement for mass education that has appeared, notably in the East. The brutal fact is that at this moment only about one in 30 can read and write. <laughs> How soon? British and Africans, working together, may have only a generation or two to accomplish what they thought to be the work of a century. The challenge must be met in this modern age. Thank <laughs> you.